This is WEFT Champaign, 90.1 FM, community radio for East Central Illinois, streaming live at www.weft.org. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Weekend Heartbeat, a series of shows that represent a collective effort to bring the thoughts and actions of people working in the nonprofit arena to the forefront where it needs to be. Join us each Saturday at this time to enjoy a different episode in this series. On the first Saturday of each month, you can hear Peace Talks Radio with Joy George. On the second Saturday, A New Lamp with Marilyn Rickey and Sean David. On the third Saturday, WFT Vision 2020 with Sandra Otten. And on the fourth Saturday, you can hear Radio Eco Shock with Doug Olive. The views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent those of WFT, its board of directors, associates, its station manager, or Prairie Air Incorporated. The following program was pre-recorded and consists of two parts. The first part was recorded in 2011. The second part was recorded in November 2014. Welcome to Weekend Heartbeat. I'm Sean David, and this is A New Lamp. New Lamp rolled. New lamp for old. Remember how Aladdin headed out to get oil for his mother's old dent and tarnished lamp? And in the market, he met a magician calling out these words. This strange man was offering to give him a brand new shiny lamp for his old one. That's what I want to offer you, if you'll have it. A new lamp of spiritual guidance. But maybe you already have such a lamp, which still burns brightly. Great. You are still welcome to join us simply to learn who we are. But maybe your lamp of divine guidance has gotten dented and tarnished like Aladdin's. Or perhaps you have no such lamp at all. To you, I offer a new lamp. Hi, my name is Marilyn. Welcome to A New Lamp, a program designed to make you acquainted with the Baha'i religious faith. I hope you will choose to spend the next few minutes with me. Thanks.
Well, hi. Thanks for tuning in again today. Last week was the first program of A New Lamp. We touched briefly on a few preliminary matters, such as the Baha'i faith being an independent world religion, the names of God, and the meaning of manifestation of God. Let's get a little more involved today. For starts, a brief history. The faith was first known as the Babi Movement. On May 23, 1844, a young man in Shiraz, Persia, which is now Iran, claimed to be the Qayyim of Shia Islam. He referred to himself as the Bab, that's B-A-B, which means gate, the gate between the old prophetic cycle to the age of fulfillment. Like John the Baptist, he claimed to be the forerunner to him whom God will make manifest, whom he said would be far greater than himself. He quickly had many followers. Persia at that time was in an appallingly decadent state, both secularly and religiously. Many people, particularly religious students and their teachers, were looking actively for the one their Shia traditions taught them to expect. This seemed, of course, a serious threat to religious and government leaders alike. The Bab was imprisoned, and thousands of his followers were barbarically massacred. The Bab was executed by a firing squad. The early years of the faith read like a fictional tragedy, and I'll tell you more about it another day. Among the Bab's followers was a man named Hussein Ali, whom we now know as Baha'u'llah. He was chained, shackled, and put in a filthy dungeon. After being released, he was exiled to Baghdad, then Constantinople, now Istanbul, and eventually imprisoned in a Turkish barracks in Akka, in what was then Palestine, and is now Israel. He was a prisoner the rest of his life. He claimed to be the one the Bob referred to as he whom God shall make manifest. To tell you about him will take more time than we have today, but I am very anxious to do so. After his death, the leadership of the faith fell to his eldest son, Abdu'l-Baha, then to his great-grandson, Shoghi Effendi. The world center for the faith is in Haifa, Israel, on the side of Mount Carmel. There are now over five million Baha'is throughout the world. There is no clergy, but elected spiritual assemblies oversee the faith in local, national, and international communities. We've not yet talked about the basic principles. It's time. Baha'is are dedicated to belief in one God and unity of all peoples and religions. Progressive revelation, elimination of prejudices of all form, Elimination of extremes of wealth and poverty. Equality of men and women. Universal education for both sexes. Individual search for truth. Harmony of science and religion. A universal supplemental language. Establishment of world peace upheld by a world commonwealth of nations. These are the basic core principles we will delve into over the weeks to come. They may seem obvious to us in the U.S. in 2011 but not in mid-19th century Persia, nor even in many countries today. Way out. Next week, let's consider the principle of progressive revelation. I think you'll find it interesting. In a bombed-out room in Belfast a young boy is crying He's alone And he don't understand How the teachings of one book Build on love and understanding The cause of her And killing in his land In an old part of Jerusalem Two children are playing
In a Pakistani village A young boy on crutches Takes a fall And lies helplessly there And he holds out his hand For no one to take it They won't touch him Clothes that he wears On a side street in Selma Black child is sitting in a squat car, protected from the whites. Cause it burning a cross to send her a message. And you can see the fear in her eyes. The purpose of religion, as revealed from the heaven of God's will, is to establish unity and concord amongst the peoples of the world. Make it not the cause of dissension and strife. The religion of God and His divine law are the most potent instruments and the surest of all means for dawning of the light of unity amongst men. Baha'u'llah. so much for being with me this morning. I hope you have found a blessing during these few minutes. If you want to learn more about the Baha'i religion, you can go online to www.bahai.us. To contact me, my email address is a new lamp at yahoo.com. Thanks and have a great day.
Welcome to the second program of A New Lamp. We are so glad to have today as our first guest, Dottie Fry, a Baha'i from the local Baha'i communities. Welcome, Dottie. Thank you, Marilyn. I'm glad to be here. Hi, oh, Dottie. Yeah. Hi, Sean. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, this is exciting. This is our second program, and you're our very first guest. Well, and, thank and you for inviting me. We're so glad to have you. Uh, so, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who are you? Well, um, I live in Savoy. I'm uh, formerly an archivist at Michigan State University and retired in 2001 uh, to come here to be near my children and my grandchildren. Actually, I'm originally from Illinois, from Decatur. I was born there and uh, I lived there until I was about 11, and then I lived in St. Louis. Uh, my husband and I met at uh, Columbia, Missouri, when I was in college at the University of Missouri, and uh, I have very strong ties with Illinois, although we have been many, many places. My husband was a journalist, and so we traveled quite a bit uh, through the years. And the funny, we don't know where life is going to take us. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> kind of whether the wind blows. <laughs> That's uh, right. <laughs> and your children. Tell us about your children. Oh, my children. Uh, David is retired from University of Illinois from the computer uh, department. And my daughter, Janie, is uh, a cell biologist. She is also retired, uh, worked at the university. And then our our third child, our daughter, uh, Karen, lives in Houston. She has a degree in library science and business administration, so she's always worked with, the, with oil companies and uh, works in records management, electronic re records management. So what interested you in being an archivist? How did that come about? Oh, well, that, that takes me to one of my special journeys, I guess. My husband and I uh, went to... Israel in 1977 to serve at the Baha'i International Center. Uh, he was the editor of the International Baha'i News Service at that time, and I worked in the research department. And you have continued to be interested in that in a smaller scale in the local community. Yes. Uh -huh. You are the librarian. And the librarian and archivist, and archivist. For the Baha'i Center in Urbana. Uh -huh. Uh, when I came back from Israel, we were there uh, about three years, and when I came back, it was so I could go back to school and study uh, archive science as a career. Really? So, uh, you've been a Baha'i quite a while? Since 1962. Um, you know, since you've been here, in, uh, have you been in this area since uh, the 60s? No. Daddy? No. Oh, oh, you were... Oh no, I've been many, many places. Many, many places. I'm kind of yeah. curious what Baha'is are doing in, in other places that you recall toward building peace in, uh -huh. uh, in, in our Well, I can tell world. you one thing because we used to live in South Carolina and we went there specifically to teach the faith. But we were only there four years and that was in the late 1960s. Um, the the Baha'i faith now is the largest minority religion in South Carolina. Really? Yes. It's, uh, if you look it up on the internet, it'll show you a map of, of the largest minorities in every state where different religions are. Uh -huh. Of course, Christianity is the, the most wide, uh, in, in terms of membership. It right. has the largest membership sure. in the right. throughout the country. Yeah. And there are sections where uh, there are large uh, numbers of Buddhists or Muslims or so forth, uh -huh. and uh, but South Carolina is where there are the most Baha'is, uh, and that's for a reason because the ta the faith was taught and welcomed there uh, in large numbers in the early seventies, and has continued to grow, and I I know many people I have many friends there. Uh, it's a delightful place, and of course, you know, one of the things, this uh, oneness of mankind, the elimination of prejudice, that's not going to happen unless, until we sit down 
and talk with a person of another race. That's right. Unless we have dinner with them, unless we, we become friends and get to know their life, it may take a very, very long time to break down the barriers, which are formidable. I've just finished reading a book called Come to the Table, which is about, um, it was written by a black woman and a white man. And it was uh, for the, their, their purpose was to do research on the reconciliation of, of the descendants of slaveholders and the descendants of the slaves. It's a remarkable book. And a remarkable organization that's come to the table. You can actually look it up on the internet. Um, they have seminars and so forth. Uh -huh. And uh, I've read quite a bit on the subject of uh, race unity and white privilege and uh, this uh, uh, this growing need and desire to become more acquainted with one another and try to eliminate those fears and it's really fear-based the divisions are fear-based sure yeah. and if you do much reading on this subject and if you spend time with people of of other races until they trust you and there's trust between you then you begin to learn where they're coming from and things that you might say, not think a thing about, is an insult to that culture, whatever it is. And But you have to get to know them individually. You have to get to know the culture. Well, when you were in South Carolina, you see that was uh, late 60s, mm -hmm. early 70s. That's right. And, and uh, the people were receptive to the Baha'i faith. Uh, at that time, in the culture generally, I assuming there was still a lot of stress between the two races. Yes, there was. Uh, did were both races equally receptive to the idea of the faith? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> no, that's an easy that's an easy answer. Easy answer. Um, mm -hmm. But they were very kind to us, and we made friends there. Uh, when we went on the project, it was uh, three families, uh, two African-American families and one white family. Um, and basically, we just made friends and tried uh -huh. to do what we could to bring about uh, friendships and so forth. Um, I, I was, it was a wonderful time of our life. We, uh, it was hard on our children because once it was known that the Baha'is believed in social integration, uh -huh. uh, they were ostracized. Oh, really? Oh, very badly, yeah. Oh. Uh, they, it was very hard for them to get through that, that period. Um, the schools, it, it happened at the same time, you know, our coming there was at the same time the schools had just been integrated. Ah. And the library where I worked had just been integrated. And uh, many of the white families immediately took their children out of school and put them in a private school there, there in that town. So that r right there became a division. Right. Instead um, of uniting and dividing. Right, right. Um, one of our friends who had moved down there, another Baha'i lady, was a school teacher, uh -huh. African American, uh, taught English and French, and is uh, very much loved in that town. She stayed there all through these years. She's been there since uh, I think 1967, 68. Yeah, 1968. Her name is Elizabeth Martin, and Elizabeth uh, eventually became pre uh, principal of the grade school there. And at the, at the time when we went there, that was unheard of. They had oh, well, they had this. separated schools, and so when they came together, finally, you know, with with an integrated staff, uh -huh. um, that took a while. And she became uh, principal 
and she's still there. She she bakes cookies for everybody in town. <laughs> she's, she uh, she says I just love them so much. I'm just gonna kill them with cookies. <laughs> I guess <laughs> I'll just kill them with kindness, and uh, maybe they will, um, you know, maybe they will love me. <laughs> well, instead of that time. Uh, you no longer live there yourself, but you are in touch with people from right. there. Has there been an improvement in the oh my. situation? It's a totally different thing. It's totally different. You would never see a, a black person and a white person, young people, walking down the street together like a boy and a girl. Yes. You would never see that. Uh, that changed, of course, you mm -hmm. know. As children got to know each other and so forth, um, just the, in fact, I went back uh, some years ago. Elizabeth had her 80th birthday, and I went back with my family and we visited. While I was there, I visited a, f a lady who had been who had become friends with me, but uh, once we began to teach openly and invite black people to our home. Uh, that all changed, and that was very typical. People would draw away from you. Yes, if they saw that the the black people were not in your kitchen cooking for you. They were actually sitting down in your living room having tea. <laughs> you know, it was uh, even though they were very close, they didn't even realize how close they were as friends. Yes, when they worked together like that. But um, anyway, I visited this friend. And uh, she said, oh, I want I to wanted tell you how sorry I am. And I said, well, what for? And she said, well, the way that I abandoned you, she said, I should have st stood by you. She became very liberal and was a columnist in the newspaper and, and was just a defender of race unity, you know, by this time. Mm -hmm. And she said, I said, well, I didn't do anything. And she said, oh, she said, what? Because of what you did, I should have been more supportive. And I said, well, what did I do? She said, you integrated the social life of Winsboro, South Carolina. Really? And I had no um, idea that that was that clear to anyone you know, uh -huh. else. I suppose it was true. Uh, it was true, but uh, it wasn't intentional. I was just, we were just living like we always have, which is making our homes open to people of all races and all religions and all nationalities and so forth. We had always done that as Baha'is. And our children had been taught that that's the right way sure. to live. So um, I was felt very, um, very grateful that I had heard that from her. Uh, after we left, one of our dearest friends, who was one of the leaders of the white community, she and her husband, she began to have integrated meetings at her home. Now, these are not Baha'i meetings. These are um, like the library board or the historic, historical society. She would, uh -huh. she would have those at her home and invite people of other races. And uh, it was quite uh, interesting. Our first integrated meeting there was when we had a visitor from, from Mauritius. That's an island near... Uh, India. Oh, I'm glad you explained that. And I never heard <laughs> Mauritius uh, Puva Murde was his name, and and we had a youth conference and his visit there, all that weekend. And we have a picture of this whole group of people, uh, Baha'is who had come from Georgia, and from um, Mississippi, and so forth. They were in uh -huh. our front yard, and we took the picture. Well, when that happened, uh, it sort of turned the town upside down. Oh my. Uh, the um, People would drive by our house just staring at our house. <laughs> you <know>? were notorious. <laughs> we were notorious. So I wrote a, a an article for the newspaper and explained, you know, in a this was a, a you know, I didn't explain. I I just wrote an article like, this is what happened this weekend. We had a wonderful, mm -hmm. you know, the youth from all these places came and had a conference and so forth. And the guest was Mr. Uh, Puva Murde from Mauritius and uh -huh. so forth, and uh, I was called into my uh, to meet meet with the president of the library board. I worked for the library board, 
And he said, I understand that you had black people in your home. Now, can you imagine this now? In, in mm -hmm. 2014, this was 1970, uh, I guess, 69, mm -hmm. something like that. And I said, uh, well, yes, that's true. Uh, they're friends of mine. They're members of my religion. And he said, well, I don't know about this. And I said, well, you know, Christ taught us that we should all be brothers and sisters. And I said, um, I told you when I took this job that I was a Baha'i and that we believed in the oneness of mankind and that I had no problem with the integration of the library. Yes. And we went on and talked for a while. And when it was over, he just sat there with it. He was quiet for a while. And then he, he uh, took my hand and shook it. And he said, well, I, I just want to say I'm very proud of you. Oh, wow. Isn't that wonderful? And, and you don't have to worry about your job. Yeah. He was, I think he was going to fire me. <laughs> 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 so, And we had so many, many miracles and wonderful, wonderful experiences down there and met so many uh, wonderful people, warm, loving, um, caring brave, courageous. Uh, it was a wonderful time of our life. Wow. I'll never forget it. One thing that I'm kind of curious about, um, because you haven't mentioned anything about it, and I wonder if you could speak to it a bit, is that I mean, you went down there and you kind of knew you were going against the grain by, oh, yeah. uh, by making all of these changes, but it doesn't sound like you went in there saber rattling and and oh, and, no. and, and, and make, causing trouble. And, and uh, so I'm, I'm kind of wondering why why didn't you do that? Well, that's totally contrary to the Baha'i teachings. We're about, we're about, we're soldiers of love. <laughs> <laughs> Our weapons are uh, cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Well, yeah, our, our uh, yeah, we. Uh, well, could I cut in um, one second? I want to. Uh, I'd like to rephrase that question that I asked. But I, I asked. I asked the question poorly. I said saber rattling, and what I really meant, marching and protesting and carrying signs and having rallies and 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 yelling in people's faces. And I'm just kind of curious about that. That's that. that when I think of civil rights, when I think of integrating black and white, that's what comes to my mind. So I'm wondering what you're describing sounds like something very different. Is wondering if you talk about that. Um, well. I, the only time I can think of Baha'is marching would be that they would join the Martin Luther King parade that that's, goes on annually. They would be represented. They would have a float in a Fourth of July parade, maybe, uh, saying the Baha'i faith, oneness of mankind. Uh, that's, that's the only kind. They're, Baha'is are not about protesting like that. This is a part of society that is very political, and Baha'is are not political. We uh, obey the laws of our country. Uh, we don't, uh, although we vote in elections, we don't uh, electioneer for any particular person. It's really quite contrary to our faith to influence the vote of any other person. So you can imagine right now with the elections going on, uh, I, my phone is turned off. <laughs> <laughs> it, my response lately has just been, I'm not political, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I have to say that. You know, and mm -hmm. um, uh, no, the, the changes that will take place are going to take place on two levels. At least, this is my own opinion. That you will have this... Um, these movements, these protests, and so forth. And it's a part of the breaking down of the old world order. And what Baha'is are doing are they're building a new world of order. And there are, there, if, if you're into destruction, and many, many people are around the world, we see that with all of these things going on now, that they believe that if you kill enough people or if you uh, conquer a people and you uh, can rule over them, that that's success. And we're about conquering the hearts of human beings who were created by God. 
and they were created to build something beautiful in, on this planet. Uh, we work closely with uh, ecologists, for instance. Uh, yes. If we we might march in a, uh, you know, one of these green parades, Earth Day parades, <laughs> Earth Day parades, <laughs> yeah. and so forth. Yes. Yeah, we would we would be very interested. In, uh, the Baha'is are closely aligned with groups such as um, Faith in Place, right, which is uh, labeled as Stronger Congregations for a Sustainable World, and we've been very much involved in that. Uh, we uh, have programs presented at the Baha'i Center on, on those subjects, and um, we encourage literacy, uh, universal education. These are just, these are things that are going to make the world better. Uh, the equality of men and women, for instance, mm -hmm. we take that for granted in this country, and yet, uh, if you talk to some people, especially women, we're not there yet. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> now, some men will argue with that and say, well, <laughs> maybe. Well, compared to yeah. a lot of other countries. Uh, right. Oh, we ain't doing too bad. <laughs> yes, we're not doing <laughs> Compared too to bad. some other countries, but compared, yes, we have right. a long way to go. The Baha'i Faith uh, <laughs> teaches that we should have a second language that everyone can understand. Uh, a universal auxiliary language. We don't have that yet. Right now, it kind of English is pretty widespread, but it's not necessarily the universal language. But in the future, we will have, in addition to our own language, we will have a second language that everyone can communicate with, because it's so essential in bringing the world together and and actually saving the planet, because we have to talk to each other and understand each other. Well, there was at least an attempt with, uh, what was that called? Uh, es Esperanto? Esperanto. Yes. Back in uh, last century. Yes. Um, that, that has not totally faded away. I, I have a friend who mm -hmm. speaks it, a young man. Uh, but it, it was a start anyway. Yes, it was. I, I knew many Baha'is uh, when I was first in the faith that uh, we're studying Esperanto. Mm -hmm. Not so much now, it's lost its popularity. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, the daughter of the man who invented Esperanto was a Baha'i. Yes. It's uh, Lydia Zamenhof. And I believe, I'm not sure, she may have visited here at one, t at really? one time. Uh -huh. um, one of our principles, too, is a spiritual solution to the economic problem. And that's such a big subject, I wouldn't even attempt to uh, explain it, <laughs> except that I will say that we're seeing more and more books coming out about ethics in business. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. That's well, the, the corruption is the other end of the, <laughs> of the spectrum. Right. And we have to begin teaching children from early age uh, these spiritual principles to be truthful, to be honest, to be trustworthy, uh, to be fair. Baha'u'llah says, uh, the best beloved in my sight is justice. Turn not away therefrom. And this is what it's about, justice. And we see injustice everywhere we turn. And if you want to know more about injustice, go to the black community. They will tell you all about it because they live it every day. Well, and I suspicion there are a lot of other people besides the blacks who also experience that, though they suffer probably the most widely. Well, in uh, this country, it, certainly. It, yes. Mm -hmm. And anytime you have this 1% up there uh, and things are getting wider and wider apart so that we have the extremely elite wealthy and the spectrum on the other end, where people don't have enough to actually put on their tables, uh, it, this, this widening and widening is uh, definitely an injustice all around things. And, and as you said, ethically, mm -hmm. uh, what, what we are taught is if you do have money, there's nothing wrong with having money, so long as it is not to the extreme 
And if you are not leaving people destitute, uh, it, it is not right for some to have excessive wealth and others to have nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody should have adequate mm -hmm. and nobody having an excess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was Baha'u'llah, and my father mm -hmm. likes to quote the scriptural quotation that, um, go to the rich and tell them of the midnight uh, sufferings of the poor. Yes. That that was... That's a, right. Yeah. Yes, that's a beautiful verse, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I, and actually, we live in a country where uh, we have had these laws passed that has changed things uh, uh -huh. and makes uh, food available. I, I am, you know, kind of shocked when I think about how much uh, people have to depend on food banks yes. to live. In this country, the richest country in the world, you know, <laughs> How can that be? How can that happen? Uh, and it may be that there's, well, I know there's always been poor people. There have always been rich people. Mm -hmm. It's that middle class that is shrinking. And uh, it that wasn't the same when I was growing up. But this country has been through so many phases, so many. I mean, we got through the Civil War. We got through the First World War. We got through the, the Great Depression, the Second World War. And we emerged victorious after that point. That there was everything was wonderful mm -hmm. <laughs> in 1950, in 1950 or something 50s, like that. Yes. But it wasn't wonderful. There were all of these social problems <coughs> that existed. Yeah, they're and, just invisible. Uh, when I think about the 60s, that was such an important revolution, social revolution. Yeah. And somehow, I think. It, I really think it was because I became a Baha'i during that time. I was hardly aware of it because I was so involved in trying to make things better for my family sure, and for my neighborhood and for uh, learning. I wanted to learn as much as I could and still do. You know, that's you never stop learning. You never stop really getting educated. Not if you intend to continue learning. And as living. a Baha'i, you have... <laughs> you have uh, you know, huge amount of published literature, and uh, uh, it's it's very unique. If you read something, if you read other th things, and then read the Baha'i, um, say the sacred writings, it's quite different. When and you, it, it takes a little bit of adjustment. You, I used to say, why doesn't Baha'u'llah just talk in plain English. <laughs> but first of all, he, he was a Persian. <laughs> There's a good reason. <laughs> he was in Persian. His writings are in Persian and in Arabic. And they have to be translated. And they have to be translated by people who are erudite scholars. They have to have it accurate. And yet we have this wonderful... Uh, ocean of literature now yes, we in do. every language in the whole world. The Baha'i faith is growing very, very rapidly around the world. And the way that it's growing is not by um, going to these places and converting people in that sense. The Baha'is go to these places now and they, they set up schools. They help set up uh, teach people how to like set up small businesses. Oh, yeah, and small businesses, yeah. And uh, we have economic, uh, social and economic development projects yeah. all over the world. Um, so, anyway, um, it's, been a, it's been a glorious journey for me. I, I just, I can't imagine what my life would have been like without the Baha'i Faith. Uh, I can't imagine the direction it would have, might have taken. Uh, what my uh -huh. children would be like today. Um, and they are all three Baha'is. They are all three Baha'is, yes. And okay. you are still active. You are still an active Baha'i. Yeah, I'll be 80 years old next week. I mean, next, I'm sorry, next April. Next, next <laughs> week I'm getting ahead of myself. I was going to say, I'm going to hit 80 before you do. <laughs> That's right, we have this. <laughs> and now you know <laughs> it's, it's on the airways. <laughs> uh, you're right, everybody knows. <laughs> Well, we are so glad to have had you here today, Dottie. Thank you. Just uh, you My presented pleasure. so much wonderful information, and 
I know there's a lot more things we could ask you. We could ask you more things about about the uh, World Center. You work there and you've pilgrimaged there and and uh, you've worked up at National Center in, in, well, in Evanston. You have just had a wonderful Baha'i life. I have. I have. I, I treasure my Baha'i family and this has taught me to love the world. And uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm happy to be here. <laughs> well, thank you. We are so glad that you came. Thank you. This is the river of everlasting life That hath flowed from the wellspring of The pen of the merciful Well, is it with them that drink? This is the river of everlasting life That hath flowed from the wellspring of The pen of the merciful Well, is it with them that drink? O oh, my servant, abandon not for that which perisheth an everlasting dominion and cast not away celestial sovereignty for a worldly desire. This is the river of everlasting life that hath flowed from the wellspring of the pen of the merciful well is it with them the drink. This is the river of everlasting life that hath flowed from the wellspring of the pen of the merciful well is it with them the drink O oh, my servant abandon not for that which perisheth an everlasting dominion and cast not away celestial sovereignty for a worldly desire this is the river of everlasting life that hath flowed from the wellspring of the pen of the merciful well is it with them the drink this is the river of everlasting life that hath flowed from the wellspring of the pen of the merciful well is it with them the drink God, unite the hearts of thy servants, and reveal to them thy great purpose. May they follow thy commandments and abide in thy law. Help them, O God, in their endeavor, and grant them strength to serve thee. O God, leave them not to themselves, but guide their steps by the light of thy knowledge, and cheer their hearts by thy love. Verily, Thou art their helper and their Lord. Baha'u'llah. Cleave ye to the hem of the raiment of virtue. Keep fast hold of the cord of piety and trustworthiness. Have regard to the good of the world and not to your own selfish desires. O peoples of the world, ye are the shepherds of the world. Keep ye your flocks unbesmirched by the mire of evil passion and desire, and adorn each one with the ornament of the fear of God. This is the firm command that hath issued forth in this day from the pen of the ever-abiding. I swear by the righteousness of God, the sword of upright conduct and goodly character is sharper than blades of steel. Baha'u'llah.
children of dust, tell the rich of the midnight sighing of the poor, lest heedlessness lead them into the path of destruction and deprive them of the tree of wealth. To give and to be generous are attributes of mine. Well is it with him that adorneth himself with my virtues. Baha'u'llah. Lord of the mountain, calling me home Feathers of angels, rippling a song In the juniper maple, sweet columbine Lord of the mountain Wildflowers and wheat fields, shining a light And every leaf pointing to the divine Ask for an answer And each atom sighs Lord of the mountain Roses are dripping All along the boughs Mulberry petals Raspberry clouds Flowers of April Settling around Musicians on today's program were Kiyu Hagagi playing the Santor in the opening segment, The Voices of Baha, directed by Tom Price, This is the Day and O Son of Spirit by Grant Hinden Miller, O Baha'u'llah, the Baha'i Choir led by Van Gilmer, and Thy Name is My Healing by Barb Qualls. If you would like to learn more about the Baha'i community in the Champaign, Urbana area, or any of the activities we have mentioned today, you can visit our website at www.cu-bahai.org. If you would like to learn more about the Baha'i faith, you may go to www.bahai.us. If you would like to contact the local Baha'i community in Champaign-Urbana, please visit our website at www.cu-bahai.org and click Contact. Thank you again for joining us today. I hope you'll join us again next month. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to this week's Weekend Heartbeat on WEFT Champaign 90.1 FM, Community Radio, Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, streaming live at www.weft.org.